the last final discussion that we can have together with you. It's the prayer of each of us bowed before you to seek for wisdom and understanding in how to read your word and apply it correctly. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> In my first presentation, we spoke about organization, and that was a de that was a development of a study that I had done at the end of December last year. I wanted to check if anybody has any questions about that subject. Um, are we doing mics or? Yeah, we are talking about like how many members each ministry has, but I know, for example, the Dutch ministry, and I don't know about the others, but it's like um, it's a foundation. So for the um, legally, then there are no members. It's just um, oh, I don't know how to explain this in English, but we have like like for example in the the church, you have members. Can and you tell me what your question is? Yeah. Uh, actually, if yeah. you need time to frame it, pass it back and I have a try in a moment. How do you explain why we are a stichting and not a vereniging? How do you say that in English? Well, what is your question then? That is your question. <laughs> That's a question to me, not to him. Well, I don't know how it is in the other countries, but if it's the same expression for people and myself. Okay. So he asked, why is our Dutch ministry, we have a certain form of organization which is not an, we just have a board and not members, official legal members, but just a board that organize things, and he wonders if that is the same in other countries, or is that different in other countries? In most countries, they don't have what you, what I understand you to be asking, is members. Yeah. <coughs> it's only a few ministries that follow that model, and I think they have to do it legally. And your question is, have I answered it? I've answered the question that it's only a few countries that do it, and they do it because of legal obligations. I'm not pronouncing it. I wanted to ask the seven light. Baptized? We follow what I understand to. Okay, sorry, yes. So the question is about who can baptize in our movement? Only elders are allowed to baptize, perform marriages, baptism, and communion. At the moment, you said those seven people. I think two of them are not yet ordained elders. 
So they currently can't. A few years ago, we, as a movement, we followed what our understanding was of a biblical model. That only elders would be allowed to, f to lead out in those roles. And there's not been any further discussion about the appropriateness of that decision. So it could be that in the future we move away from that model. But at the moment there's no, there's no discussion or there's no motivation to do that. What we didn't discuss is that there are elders underneath them, local or national elders, who have the same rights, privileges, and duties as being a, as an elder. So Elder Maurice, or Maurice is an elder, but he's not at that level, he's one below. And he's not the only one, there are several across the world. Any other questions on organization? Question is like what I know from when I was in the church, you have this kind of, dim well, they try to have a democratic system. Like if you are a church member, you can vote who will be in the board and you can send. Yes, and then the church sent representatives to the union and the union to the general conference. That's the Adventist church. But how does that work in this movement? Like, yeah. <laughs> Do you not know how it operates? No, it seemed to me, it seems, because that was actually about the top down and the like bottom up system. To me, it seems like the leaders decide everything, but maybe I'm wrong, maybe I just don't know. Yeah. Okay, um, Arian, your question. Um, in one of your presentations, not the one from this week, but earlier, um, you mentioned these, these, these two models, you, you choose people based on the, <clears throat> the God model, uh, God chooses you in this position, or on the personal qualification model. Um, sorry. <coughs> you didn't elaborate on that further in their presentation, I think also because of time. Um, I think you said that you preferred the personal qualification model. Um, so I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little more. Um, that was my question. What, what that would look like in our movement, um, an, a, a personal qualification model. So. I don't know if everybody's watched that presentation that I did. The qualifications of leadership. So the reason I haven't answered Walter's question yet because I knew it was going to be the same question from Arian. What I would like to know from yourselves so we'll do a vote. Who prefers God or Providence to choose people in leadership positions? Or who prefers a different model 
we'll, we'll say a democratic one where people are voted into position. So I'll make it simple. You vote or I vote. That's the two options. Me voting means I choose. You voting means you choose. So put your hands up. If you want me to choose your leaders. Okay, put your hands down. Hope, please everybody vote, don't abstain. Because I think it's disrespectful to these two people who have asked a legitimate question. So around 11 people said they would prefer me to vote. And I'm going to guess that's around, I'm going to say 25% of this congregation. So that means 75% of you don't agree with that. So everybody that abstained, for whatever reason, you don't want to participate, you don't care, you don't understand, you're on the other side. So I'll give you one more opportunity. So now you know the terms of this discussion. If you want me to vote on your behalf, Put your hands up. Okay, thank you. We're up to about 40% now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know what happened. So, everybody who voted for me Realize that you're in the minority of the movement. And if this is a representative, uh, a represent fair representation of the movement, this movement does not like the way we have constructed ourselves, the way we operate. So seeing as the majority of you don't like the way we have been set up, what you have to ask yourselves is what do you want to do about it? Do you want to fight for your rights? Do you want to start again? Or do you want to say from now onwards, Nobody is appointed in any leadership position without your vote. So I'm not going to do that exercise today. But I want us to really think about this. Your definition of democracy and where you think power should reside. Because I'm guessing that the 60% of you who said you don't want me to do all the work, what you actually are saying is it's not fair representation. And the problem is that you all are aware of is that there's no security or safety in democracy because that system of governance has now been hijacked and is now being used to promote evil people into powers of res into positions of responsibility 
So if you want to take control of that, you have to ask yourself, are you sure that you're going to do a better job than I would? Because you have to be sure that you will do a better job. Because it's hard to undo things. So that single question asked by two people is a question that I've been asked several times. And I'm glad it's being asked because I think it's important for me to consider that and for you to consider that. Because if we decide to make some change, we should do it sooner rather than later. And then you need to decide how high up you want to instigate those changes. So I'm talking to the people who voted no. The majority of you. You need to really consider what changes you want. I think you're all familiar with this phrase, the law of unintended consequences. Democracy sounds seductively nice. But in many places, it's a weapon of mass destruction. And I'm not, that this is not my uh, political statement to say, vote for me. I'm trying to be frank and honest and not discuss my position. So I'm going to bring this subject up on an ongoing basis so that you have an opportunity to really consider what it is that you want. I can't speak on behalf of the other leaders, but seeing as I'm their boss, if you, the members, request, demand change, I think you'll probably get your way. But once we undo that structure that we have, you're going to end up having to live with whatever you create. I have a question over here. Radka, um, how's that going to work? Oh, if you give it to, if you give it to Magda or Thomas. Volbu Boha. Bůh nás. Uh, ty jsi. Jako pro nás, jako zástupce Boha. To byla otázka. To je otázka. To tam bylo. A ptal, tu dal na tu druhou. Ale on se nás neptal, on se ptal. Ptal se. Tu se ptal. Ne, on se ptal, nebo ho byla ptal. Ptal se. Could I um, ask the microphone to be given to Asi and then decide? Have a conversation where you want to go with that um, at the front here. <coughs> I was just having an idea. Uh, isn't there a possibility of a combination of both? Like if there is demand, um, one might like to suggest some, someone to you and you decide. 
Beispiel, wenn jemand jemanden vorschlägt, you know what I mean? du entscheidest dann. So I understand what you mean. Ich verstehe, was du so meinst. there wouldn't be like a either or, but you could could take some suggestions and think about it. Also nicht entweder oder, sondern dass du just, ähm, Vorschläge annimmst und darüber nachdenkst. Just as uh, an idea, a suggestion. Nur als ein Vorschlag. No? Okay. Any other questions? Someone else had their hand up? Arian? I, di I didn't raise my hand. Um, <clears throat> but that was not to, and I, don't, I cannot speak for the, for the rest of the people. For me personally, it's not that I want this movement oh, to, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't raise my hand. Um, ich hab mich nicht um, I did not raise my hand. Um, but for me personally, that did not mean, I, w I didn't want to say this movement need to be restructured from top to bottom everywhere. This movement has been organized or set up in a certain way uh, through the years. And that was all fine and good and perfect, I think. Das war alles gut und perfekt, denke ich. Now we come perhaps to the realization that the model that it was based upon was not ideal, not, yeah, not ideal. So m my thought, or at least the reason why I did not raise my hand was Der Grund, warum ich mich nicht habe, ist um, th the future decisions that we have to make. Die die wir müssen, so I'm not saying leadership should be changed, everybody in the positions they have should be removed and it should all be democratically be nicht, chosen. or with a, vote, with a voting system. But that we're going to think, I guess that's what you said, that we're going to think about a model or a system that comes closer to a... Um, sorry? This op that operates differently than, than we did in the past, or better in the past. In the past, we j you just got a position because you knew the right people, uh, you had the, uh, friends, or you uh, were in the right place at the right time. To do that differently in the future, or to... I'm not saying to set up a, a Seventh-day Adventist system with uh, voting. Or anyway, it, it, it's not really a question, but it's... Uh, you gave us two options that are two extremes. Uh, I don't want to be on the far extreme of... I voted for one, but it's not the... the um, I wasn't on that. I don't want to be on the extreme side, if that's the right word to say. I'm sure none of us want to be on any of these extreme positions. But I think once you go down that road, whichever road you take, we're already on one of them. However you want to personally define extreme, you'll get to a place where somebody is promoting someone they know. Whether it's you or me. Because you're not going to vote for someone you don't know. The only difference is, 
four of you will vote for someone you know. And the other way is one of us will vote for who they know. Because it sounded, that's the model that you were proposing. It sounded to me that way. Which is an extreme position. To not have a solution. Sure. I know we don't have solution to these things. My point is, it's easy to sound reasonable. And to make me sound extreme. But to me, your reasonable proposition and the one that Atti proposed, which is the same one, the slight variation perhaps, is the extreme position that I said it was. Because all of you will only vote for people that you know. That you like, that you trust. Which is the same that I do. The only difference is where the power resides. In my hands or yours. So, feel free. Then I want to go back to your presentations two weeks ago about these two models, the wrong model and the right model, or the... Uh, so... What Arian has pointed out is the duplicity, or perhaps even hypocrisy, of what I'm saying now. But I don't think that it is. I'm saying, I don't care about your personal testimony. I don't care where God led you, or how God led you, or if God led you. If I like you, I'll promote you. If I don't, I won't. And when you make your decisions, you can decide on what basis you choose. Your friend told you that they had a religious experience 10 years ago and that qualifies them. Or they're a hard faithful worker. So I don't see a discrepancy in what I said a few weeks ago to what I'm saying now. Then I was discussing the qualifications for leadership. And today, I'm asking who makes that decision? Who makes that choice? Feel free to come. If you disagree with what I've said, or. I'm, I'm not sure if I fully. Okay. No, 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 not fully. Uh, may in, uh, fully understand the link with the presentation before, but because mm -hmm. because it's your presentation that kind of kept me, got me thinking about it. Became to the realization that perhaps the way we do things and or the the. the the way we have done things in the past wasn't maybe the right thing to do. That was basically my conclusion from your presentation. Maybe that was wrong. Let me address that. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go in this movement, when people talk about Elder Tess, we'll say Elder Jeff, because he's a softer target to attack. Their argument is not that he was clever, not that he did hundreds of hours of study, it's that God raised him. My question is, how do you know? What's your 
What's your marker, your reference point to know if someone's raised by God or not raised by God? How do you define what talents are? Talents. Is it some spiritual power that God gives you? That you were born with? The first one would be Miller. The second one would be John the Baptist. Or is it someone who's clever? Goes to seminary and understands the Bible really well. People have different views on how or what makes somebody competent. Most people seem to have this idea that Elder Tess's, I call it cleverness, is supernatural as opposed to hard work and being intelligent. If you believe that, that's fine. I'm not attacking that. What I was trying to say in that previous study, if I was choosing a leader, I would choose someone based upon the ability that I see. Not their testimony. So that was that issue. So now I'm saying, if I was to choose somebody, I've already stated publicly what my methodology would be. My question today was, who does the deciding? You or me? And if it's you, I didn't ask you on what basis you decide. Do you want a hard, pers a hard worker or a charismatic speaker? You need to decide that. So that's how I see that previous study and the, one th the discussion we're having today fit together. I don't take much notice when a presenter cries in front of you or has some emotional statement to make. I don't want to destroy or rubbish providence. Yesterday, I think it was, in response to the question about the third angel's message, etc., I said the answer was obvious, 9-11, 2016. Now, it was bad of me to do that because most of you don't know me personally. But those of you who do, you knew that was a joke that the fact that that study was done in Germany at 9-11 does not give it any weight or authority. It was just a hook because lots of people remember that date. But lots of people take dates and times and see it as God's leading. And I think it's a dangerous way to proceed. And I know many of you disagree with that. You think it's good or appropriate. And you're free to hold that opinion. I don't fight against it. So before we do the voting, you need to know, if you're voting for me, the basis on which I do my selection. 
I've afforded you the privilege for not e to not even ask you what your methodology is. I've, I've not even asked you what your methodology is. But I've told you mine. I won't choose spiritually minded people. Spiritually minded means they have some testimony that God led them. I just I won't do I don't agree with that. I don't trust it. Let me put say that. I don't trust when people say I'm in love with this person. I didn't know what to do. And what are they gonna do? The worst than prayer, they're not gonna even pray. They get their book, open it up randomly, close their eyes. And God will speak to them. And they're going to base their, the rest of their life on that. I'm not ridiculing that. I'm saying I don't think that's a good way to live. Many people do. And I'm not criticizing you if you believe that. But I think it's fair that you know where I stand on things. Does that help, Arian? Good. Okay, so if there's no more questions on organization, I haven't answered the question, how we go about choosing leaders and what we should do. If there's nothing else, I want to go back to t yesterday's study. So at the end of the study, I'm going to do what I shouldn't do, talk on a blank board. <laughs> we had a black three, and I think we had a green three. And what I did, naively, I said, oh, we're all friends now. I was, not we, but they, if some of you, won the argument, persuaded the other side, or at least silenced them, that it wasn't that. We're all on the same page, it's 3A here. And I got in trouble afterwards, offline, Say we didn't agree to that. Don't say we're in agreement until we tell you we're in agreement. And I think that's a fair criticism of what I did. So I want to apologize publicly for saying that we all agree that the arrival of the third angel's message is 2001. <coughs> because some of us still may not be persuaded. So, I asked everybody to look at a Spirit of Prophecy quote. Not the one that I provided, but the one that was given to us. In the English, it's what's, what reference is it? Great controversy. Okay, so I, that was the one that was given to us as the defense or the argument, the logic, to say the third angel comes at the Sunday law. And we dissected this, not properly. And for those who felt that the great controversy st uh, statement upheld a Sunday law third angel, I want to give you the opportunity to 
affirm that position or if you have changed to say you see it differently? So is anybody, does everybody understand what I'm asking? Some people said GC605 pointed to a Sunday law, third angel. If that was your position yesterday, have you had sufficient time to look at the passage by yourself and either come to the conclusion that yes, it's still there or you've changed? Or vice versa. If you said it was pointing to a 9-11 third angel and you've changed your position, that's fair too. Anybody want to volunteer to speak their mind? Share their opinion? I'm I'm, re I'm reticent to identify names again. I'd like them to volunteer if they're willing to. Sylvie? Oh, one moment. <coughs> has to come before the Sunday law because he has a message. Okay, so what I'm asking is, based on this GC quote, does anybody identify that quote as being Sunday law? And you've said no. So I want to know if anybody still holds to that position. So I understand that you don't. So is there, does anybody does anybody still believe that, or are we all on the same page now? I'm hoping silence means yes, we're all in, the, in agreement. Jonathan. Explain why it's not. Yesterday I didn't explain why it was or why it wasn't. Other people did that. Whether they did it well or not is up for discussion. But for those who studied the passage, I'm hoping they may be able to answer. What they see in that passage to make them think that it's not a Sunday law. So, who's willing to do that? Who's willing to go into the passage and show us why it's not Sunday law? No, Jonathan asked why it isn't at the Sunday law, why it's at 9-11. Yes? So I'm asking someone to answer his question. But only based upon the quote. So before we do that, Lizanne's going to respond. And we're in GC 605, paragraph 3. So you have the ability to go to the passage because she's going to, I hope she's going to read from there certain words. 
and explain her logic. Go ahead. So actually, we, we are, we're looking at the last sentence, but you can also look at the first sentence. There said, heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. So before... It goes a little bit fast. It needs mm -hmm. to get translated. Heretofore, before this, those who presented the third angel's message... was regarded by the world as sounding a false alarm. Is that a fair paraphrase, Lizanne? Yes, okay. it is. And then actually the last sentence of this quote says the same. But as the question of enforcing Sunday ob observance is widely agitated, Read the whole sentence oh. and I'll paraphrase. The event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching and the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. So that was the, there's the introductory sentence and then the last sentence. So I just want to remind us that Lisanne is using a standard methodolo methodological technique well established in our movement. You use the opening sentence, and then you use the con then you go to the concluding sentence, and she's going to show, I think, a repeat and enlarge. So she's following all the rules. I say that because it then allows you to have some level of confidence in her position. If we're all okay with that. So she said, last sentence, but as the question of enforcing Sunday law, it's not a law yet, just called observance, is widely agitated in the world. The event law, which has not been believed by the world, and in this context, America, disbelieved, is seen by the world as approaching. So what everybody said can never happen, is everybody can now see is not only can it happen, but it is happening. And now, the third angel will produce an effect in this situation that it couldn't have had before. Is that a fair paraphrase? Yes, it is. Okay. Tell us your logic now. So during this agitation of the Sunday, uh, Sunday law, actually, then the third message has an effect. That it do, this not, did not have before, so it should have been there before this agitation. So we see that, the, that we see that the same in the first sentence. There it says the third angel's message. Uh, uh, those who presented the third mes angel's message <coughs> before this agitation, they were regarded as mere alarm alarmists. But now they're taken seriously. So we see that the third angel's message has <coughs> power during, or is, is regarded as, as truth during this agitation, but it was there before. So let me bring those points together, Jonathan. The passage says, 
that I'm going to say the world can see the Sunday law approaching. So it says enforcing, that means law, Sunday observance, that's the Sunday law, approaching. So we know we're before the Sunday law. That's the historical context. Present tense, the third message will. Present tense, before the Sunday law, do something. So that's the proof to show it can't be at the Sunday law. So that's the first logic. And then it says at the beginning, sorry, the, begin the last word says before, and the first word says heretofore. So they're both the same word. So Lizanne's reading of that is that the heretofore and the before these two are before what? What do you think it's before? Before the message could have an effect? I would suggest we shall think what Lizanne was saying is actually before or before the agitation. Which I think is the same as you've said. But she's saying it's be bef it, it, it was here before the agitation, but it couldn't do anything. So that was the argument of why GC605 shows the arrival of the third angel before the Sunday law. Does that answer your question? So I don't know if that answers everybody's question. I think, if I remember, Lizanne has said the same thing that she said yesterday. Is that correct? I think. It, it was you, yes? Yes. Other people spoke as well. So this doesn't prove 9-11. And we said why it can't prove 9-11. Why can't it prove 9-11? Anybody? Someone want to give a... Thomas? You don't know? Okay. Anyone else? Anyone besides Lizanne? Hopefully we'll try and get... Oh, good, someone else. L'arrivée du second ange qu'on a placé hier au 11 septembre. Chimène. <laughs> if you give it to either Vidim or Chimène, one of the two. The arrival of the second angel that we placed at the that we placed at the 9-11. Repeat that. The arrival of the second angel that... She said that bit already. Oh, uh, that we have placed at the 9-11. We placed. We placed it. That's a good answer. But I think the simple answer Lizanne? The text doesn't say that, that it's um, <laughs> in 2001. It's that simple. The text doesn't tell you that. <laughs> and Ellen White was never shown 9-11. Where did we get 9-11 from? Where did we get 9-11 from? 
he is one of us. So we invented that based upon what? Really simply. Um, who's, is there, if, if no one's going to answer that, I'll get the mic to Curtis. Who said that? Who said Islam? Oh, Esther. Esther said Islam. So it's, is, no? Oh, okay, you said Islam, and Esther said Revelation 18. What's Revelation 18? She didn't say that in Revelation 18. Revelation 18 is John. Ellen White didn't write Revelation 18. I know you know the answer to this, but we just I want to make sure we get it correct. Okay, Curtis, just help her out. Pass the mic along. You're correct, Esther, but it, we just need to tidy it up. Yeah, so can I just tie thoughts that were said? Um, by associating the events of Islam at 9-11 with a quotation from Ellen White, 90-11 and other places, Review and Herald, and misusing that where Ellen White spoke about Revelation 18, and um, towers coming down. So what we did was, we saw an event in the newspaper, like the stars falling, and we said, we read something about that, and therefore that, e that event is a fulfillment of that passage of inspiration. which happened to be Testament of the Church, Volume 9, beginning page 11. The event happened on 9-11. And if I can call it the dream, was where? In New York. And the attack happened in New York. So that's why I say, we created 9-11. We created this way, Mark. Whether you agree with that methodology or not. By the way, we used that methodology for 2001. What did we reject? Give me the year. Who said? Who said? We rejected 2020. So 2001, we accepted based upon New York. And then 2020, I'm going to go with that date. Because Jonathan said, I can't remember. We reject based on exactly the same methodology. Which was? Not the date. Nashville. And the date? We know the date, 18? 18th of July. So, I just want to, want to make us aware of this, because what had we learned in these 19 years? 
yes, we'd learnt bad math, but what was the bad methodology? You've got one, two, three. Which one did we learn? That was the bad. Yes. We said, because Ellen White had the dream in New York, the event had to happen in New York. Over a decade later, much later than that, we went back to the verses and we said that if we call it 90, is referring to what event? It's not 2001. Three? Which event in the future? Okay, so Curtis has said, it's close of probation. We knew a decade later, long before 2020, that that was not good methodology. That what she was actually referring to was something that's going to happen over here, which was the general destruction of the world. And that taught us something that we have used since then, which is our approach to inspiration. Half this movement, not literally, wanted to maintain this same methodology. They called it the Laodicean methodology. And they were firm on this, and we rejected it. That's got nothing to do with this study. But I thought it was important for us to remember why GC605 does not prove the third angel comes at, not at two, 2001. What it does prove... is if this is agitation, it comes before that. That's what we knew. So we, we haven't taken the final step <coughs> to bring it back to 9-11. I think we did discuss it yesterday, but maybe it wasn't a very good proof. I don't know in people's mind. Okay, so then I offered us, if anybody got any questions? Then, one second. Before that, what was the big... The formulation. So the question is the agitation, the formalization of the message. And some people will say it is, and some people will say it isn't. So I don't think it's relevant or germane to this study. Because if I say it is or it isn't, it then becomes law. And worse, if I say I don't know, you'll say, why are you our leader then? <laughs> so I show my ignorance. So I, I take the Fifth Amendment. it probably is okay so if we're okay with that I offered a second line of, ed of evidence or argument which was over here Matthew 13 the wheat and tears and I said there's a good booklet if you want to study this subject And nobody asked me anything about that, which I was surprised about. Or you've all got copies of it. 
Or you've all got copies of the document. I don't know. So, no, no advertisements now. We can speak later to the powers that be. So I want us to go to a Bible passage. We'll go to John chapter 16. Beginning verse what? John chapter 16. Arian, you shouted the num number? Okay. Muriel? Verse? Oh, we're not there yet, okay. Who said that? Who said verse 8? So verse 8, Christian said verse 8. We want to go to uh, John chapter 16, verse 8. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Then, again, we used to do this, verse, verses 9-11, of sin, because they believed, they didn't believe in me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So, we've got sin, righteousness, and judgment. Marcel, why have I gone there for? Why have I gone to sin, righteousness, and judgment in John 16, 8? When I said we should be going to Matthew 13. Because the three uh, steps. Three steps. A bit more. First, second, and third angel. So Marcel said the first, second, and third angel. So now I'm going to put, these are not the arrivals, these are angels. And then he said, before that, three steps. Three steps of what, Marcel? Daniel 12, 10? No. Everlasting gospel, yeah. The, th the three steps of the everlasting gospel. So... We teach, we believe, the Revelation 14 is an expansion or an explanation of the everlasting gospel, given in three steps. And you see these three steps in different places, which is why Marcel went to a different passage. You can find it in different places in different stories. So we've read the verses 9 to 11 that explain each one of these. Someone explain this one, the sin. I'll read the verse again. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Somebody explain that verse. Tell me what the sin is. Someone's got to put their hand up so they can get a mic. Please don't say fear God. That doesn't, doesn't take us anywhere. That just takes us to Revelation something. Who's going to who's put the hand up? Oh, Tamina? Uh, rejection of the first angel's message. So I'm just going to say it's rejection. And Tamina said rejection of the first angel. 
I'm going to say yes or no. Shemaine, am I going to say yes or no to that answer? Tamina said, "Reject this sin is the rejection of the first angel's message. You agree or not? No. I don't agree either. I don't think it's rejection of the first angel. It's the words of the first angel that says... that you do not believe. If this is a line, when did they not believe? Before, because we used to teach, before the line begins, we have a period of darkness. That's lack of belief. The first angel says, you are in trouble because you don't believe. Are we okay with that? Okay with that explanation? Good. So th the second one, so I'm going to take, it's not rejection. It's about belief. Second one, righteousness. Of righteousness because I go to God and you don't see me anymore. Someone explain that. I helped you before the presentation started because they said do sound checks and I was reading all the famous Bible commentaries on that f passage so I really, got, yeah, I really gave you the answer. <laughs> okay, we'll walk through it. Who's he speaking about? It's easy. Jesus. Speaking about Jesus... And who or what is Jesus? Don't say the Christ. No, Jesus isn't justice. So Jesus is a human. And I think Ellen White uses the following term. I'm going to say... She may say model, but I think it's pattern. She says Christ is the pattern man. Which means what? Our role model. What Christ was, we are to be. This is the whole study of the nature of humanity. It's a study of the nature of Jesus. And Ellen White says, Christ's humanity is everything to us. Because if you don't understand this person's humanity, you don't understand the equality message. And maybe some of us have forgotten that. Or maybe never understood it that way. Okay, so the righteousness is what? Why can't we see Jesus anymore? Because Jesus is going to go to heaven. Based upon what? His? Not victory, you said the word before. His righteousness. His personal righteousness. Everyone else is stuck here. But Jesus, because of his righteousness, is going to go to heaven and we can't see him anymore. So the second step is about personal righteousness. The third step of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. 
Who's the prince of this world? Satan is judged. What's that got to do with anything? What has John or Jesus, depending on who you're going to say, what has he just done? Someone else. He's compared and contrast. Curtis? He's, he's juxtaposed two people. Who? Who are the two people? That's fine. Jesus and Satan. He's juxtaposed two people. Jesus of righteousness because I go to heaven. Of judgment because the prince of the world. So those two people, individuals, who are juxtaposed, it's done for what purpose? Because who is Jesus? Us, the righteous humans. So who is the prince of this world? The others. I can't remember the terminology that used in Daniel 2. The chaff. The tears. Those who are put into bundles and burned. Sinners. So these two people become representatives of humanity. Are we okay with all of that? Okay, so let's go to our other favorite passage. We question or statement, I don't know. <coughs> Make it an easy one. Yeah, I just missed a step in your logic uh, oh. as to um, we are the representatives. Why? Uh, I, there's a gap between your final point and your first point. Jesus is our pattern, what humans were and are designed to be. And he ends up representing half of humans, those who go to heaven, because of their righteousness. And then there's another group. who are represented by Satan of judgment because of the prince of this world is judged. Okay? Then. Well, I don't know what you mean us. You mean you? Uh, you? I assume when you said us, you meant this movement. I meant all the righteous people. Okay. Because okay. I hope we're all righteous. <laughs> Our next favorite passage. This was what passage? John 16. Our next one? Not Matthew. We've got another step before we get there. Sorry. Not Mark. Not Revelation. Not Daniel, not Hosea. <laughs> Who said something? Book of Acts. Someone finish it off, not him. Not my friend. Not Acts 2. Not 27. <laughs> Acts 24. Tell us the story. What, what's the subject? It's Paul before some Roman leader. Whether it's a king or a governor, someone. So the verse is 25. Acts 24, 25. 
And as he, Paul, is this Felix, I think, double check, it tells you before. As he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled. We'll stop there. So Felix is scared. It says righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Three things. Just give me the le first letter for number one. Arian says, oh, anybody disagree? If you, you can't hear me? Oh, you can't hear? Oh, he said R. The first letter for number one. Does anybody disagree with R? Everybody agree? Number two? So if we agree with that, are you okay with that, Magda? So can you pass the microphone to Magda? Explain why righteousness has moved position, please. You don't know? Did you notice that it's moved? Okay. So if you notice only now, keep the microphone. If you only notice now, why did you put R there? Sorry? You only put R there because you saw it as the first of the three things. As opposed to putting it in its same place and putting T over here. Everybody notice that? Mm -hmm. So if you agree with that, someone tell me why R has moved position. Um, Janice. <laughs> so Janice says, wait, well, they've got to hear your voice because I don't want to. No, no, fine. Sorry? No, no, I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to hear her say it. <laughs> because it's in the text? The because text. it's in the text. That's the same answer that Magda gave. I think. Or not. When you said it's in the text, you mean it's in that order? Yeah, the order. Yeah. You're an experienced teacher. So I was wondering, shouldn't it be the other way around? But I didn't know if I was allowed to do that. Everyone's allowed to do what they want. <laughs> and you agreed with this. Oh, she said she wasn't allowed to, she didn't know if she was allowed to change these. And I said, does everybody agree? And it turns out that Janice didn't agree. So you want to swap them? I don't mind, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Janice wants to swap them. <laughs> because she knows that just because it's in this order in one verse, it could be in a different order in another verse. Andreas, you said it's in the right place. Tell me why. I said it was in the right place? Sorry? What did I say? I, I didn't say anything. I asked everybody, are they happy with that? Okay, no okay. one that disagrees, so you agreed. You're happy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> How?
How can righteousness move position? Um, because it's the opposite of uh, sin and... It, because it's the opposite of sin. So that's Andreas's response. So what Andreas is saying, Paul, being the tricky teacher that he is, instead of saying, not being righteous, he just said righteous. But he meant not righteous. That's Andreas's explanation of that verse. Janice, what do you think? I didn't understand. That Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I did not understand what he said this way, how, how he just repeated it. You don't agree or you didn't understand what Andreas said? I understood something else when he said it. Okay. Explain, what, explain your perspective of this verse. I think we can use um, the first verse as a, a pattern. And then when we get a second verse and we recognize similarities, we, we see there's... Too much. Oh, you won't sorry, get translated. <laughs> we can use the first wor verse as a pattern. And we see uh, a similar verse. Um, we see there's an R as well. <laughs> We will line it up with what we saw in the other in the other verse. We will line it up with what we saw in the first verse. <coughs> Tell me if this is correct. This is your template. We'll call it first usage. When we come to a second one, we'll stay with the pattern. <coughs> Whatever the order said, we'll put it in its right order. Yes? Okay, so Janice agreed with that. We'll just go with simple dictionary definitions. In your mind, what's the difference between being righteous and being temperate? Tell me what the, what, what the difference is before you answer. Sin and righteousness, are they diametrically opposed? Complete opposites. That's the question to you, Janice. Yes. Yes. So they're opposites. So according to your understanding of being right or righteous, or being temperate and having temperance, are they diametrically opposite? No they, no, they don't seem to be opposites, no. If they're not opposite, what are they? They're synonyms. They're the same? Yeah. So if I swap this, like you suggested, you're in the same mess that you started with. Mm -hmm. You've said temperance is here. And temperance is the opposite of sin. So if you wanted to do what you said, you'd have to say, not temperate. Be righteous. <coughs> okay with that? Yep. So whoever's correct about the position you both have to do the same thing. You have to, you, you have to add some context. Okay with that? That's fine. So either way, it says you're not temperate. You have to be righteous. I'll put words into Andreas's mouth. Because in the context of... Felix, 
What's his real life problem? If you wanted to target his sin. Compromise? Intemperance. If you look at his life, I think it's intemperance that Paul is going to put his finger on. He was morally and physically intemperate. And if you didn't know that, you might be tempted to swap them. But Paul is saying, your sin is intemperance. So he says, be temperate. Either way, it's fine. So based upon this, now where do we go, Magda? Matthew 13. So how do we approach Matthew 13? We in the movement. So it's an agricultural model, and we will identify certain people. The owner, the servants, the reapers, and the plants. Who is the farmer? I didn't hear what someone said. God. So you could have said Jesus, but God will f- is a good answer. The reapers. Angels? Plants? The servants. Humans. So these are angels, but these are humans. I want your perspective. I want people's perspective of how they understand this. So people have said humans. I obviously don't like your answer because I'm not putting it down. (laughs) As we're running out of time, I'm just going to put angels. So based upon that, the most of you disagree with, which you shouldn't do. What does that teach us? We approach this passage in Matthew 13 in a very specific way. And I'm I'm doing this Because we seem to be confused about something with respect to the angels and their placement. And I think this passage, if you could pass the microphone to Magda, I think this passage, back when it was done, clarified a point that I think people either didn't see then with clarity or have forgotten now after seven years, which is... which are both understandable. And so when Tamina said it depends, 
course, it depends because we're doing this study, not apostate Protestantism. Magda. So the servants and the plants arrive at the same time um, in the Matthew 13. So the servants and the plants arrive at the same time. So after the ground is, after plowing, there the seeds are sown. So. So after plowing, the seeds are sown. I want to stop you there, Magda, because what you're doing is walking us through the steps. And before you do that, we need to understand a concept or an approach to this passage. Because I resisted putting humans here. And it's that discrepancy in your minds and mine that has brought some discord between us. So I want us to understand what this is teaching us. Okay, so if we're not sure, remember these two. Who are these two? Don't say Jesus and Satan. Who are they? Not the church. Sorry, who said what? They're human beings. So we'll go with their humans. Do we see humans anywhere? Here. So, these two humans are represented by this group, <coughs> if we're okay with that. So, these plants, how many plants are there? Two types of plants. The wheat and the tears. Christ and Satan. Repeating patterns. So, how do you become righteous? Magda, how do you become righteous in this story? Mark helped you if you're not sure. Go ahead, Magda. You don't know. So keep the microphone. What did the servants do? You've told us before. Observing. Observing. Before they observed. Sowing the seeds. They sowed seeds. Which seeds did they sow? The good seeds. Okay. Good seeds. The wheat. So when did these people become good? When they were sown. When they're in the hands of the servants. The angels. If they let the angels take care of them, they're good. What I didn't put here is him. At night time an enemy came and plowed and planted different seeds. The source is different. So what this study taught us is that humans become righteous not just by the rain but when they're in the hands or under the stewardship or control of the angels. So righteousness, which is the definition of being the right plants, 
is a human experience. So we took that model, and you could say it's right or wrong, which you're, which you're more than will it, you're more than allowed to do. We said that the plants are what? Righteous humans. We're not talking about the tears. We're not speaking of the tears. And the servants work on these plants and look after them. So there's some ploughing that's done. Doesn't tell you who did them. This way, Mark, is what, Magda? Seven. No, Nine. in Matthew 13. Sowing. This is the sowing. This way, Mark, Magda? Um, when the fruit is... Um, right at the end. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, um, har harvesting, reapers, um, yeah. reaping. So now they're ripe... And it's harvest. And now you have a different group doing some work on those plants. So these servants begin their work when? Muriel, are you here? Can you pass the mic to Muriel? Muriel, when did the servants begin their work? Quand euh, le, les graines ont été semées. The sowing? Oui, quand les graines ont été semées. So they begin their work here. Mm -hmm. And when do the servants end their work? Avant la moisson. Is that harvest? Before the, the harvest. So you say that the servants ended their work before harvest. Is that right? Yes, because... Uh, when did they end their work? Tell me when. At the harvest. Sorry? À la moisson. At harvest. At harvest, not before. Oui, avant la moisson. At harvest. Before the, uh, before the harvest. If it's before harvest, you've got to tell me what that way mark is in the story. Ah, before... I don't have a, 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 a remark before harvest, so I tell you at harvest, because you have another, another, uh, another person who do a work after. Okay, so Muriel has said, with some pressure, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that they have to finish their work at harvest, <laughs> because you couldn't see where they would finish before. And she agrees that there's reapers afterwards. Who tells the reapers to come? Muriel? Just give me the number. One or two or three. Who tells the reapers to come? Number one does. Number one is the boss. Who tells number one that the plants are ready? Uh, Muriel. The two. Number two. So if number two, the servants tell the farmer that the plants are ready, it means that their work ends at harvest. Logic will tell you that, and you see it in the passage as well. Mm -hmm. If you want to comment. Yes, I just want to say that if they, they say something to the farmer, it's because they see something. So Muriel said, if, they, if the servants speak to the farmer, it's because the eyes of the servants... 
See, the plants are ready. Correct? Yeah. Okay, so Muriel and I are in agreement now. If you can all see the logic. Muriel, where do you put the sowing of the seed? What, what, on the line of 140,000, what way mark is that, the title? La ligne des 144,000? 9-11. Okay, 2001. We should say 2001. Tess has taught us that and it's correct. I know. <laughs> I know. <coughs> I have to be rebellious. Muriel, this one? FTG. F, uh, COP. Close the probation. So what we've defined now is some servants who begin at 9-11 and end at the close of probation. And what we have not put in this story is the Sunday law. Because it's, we know at the Sunday law, which Magda was going to take us through, Before the Sunday law, what's the problem with the servants? Who's speaking? Arian? So the problem with the, with the servants is they don't recognize the plants. So we can either see or say, Bad servants or plants that camouflage well. I don't mind which one. But once they bear fruit, then you can see a difference. And there's another symbol which we didn't put. What triggers fruit? Rain. Okay, so now we used Matthew 13 to overlay upon our standard model. But what this showed us is that these plants are righteous. So the second angel or the second message, because it's not really an angel, its work is in this history. And if the second is connected to the plants, taking care of them, who does that? Who takes care of the plants? Servants. So we had angels in plural. But those same ones... From day one, are doing what? What else are they doing besides taking care of plants? Not reporting. They're judging. Who said that? So they're judging the plants. Who does all the judging? It's the third angel's work. So we use Matthew 13 as, if you like, a second witness for the GC605 quote to show that these servants are not only the second but the third angel as well taking care of us. You have to jump through some other logic We were told it depends on the context. But if you do it this way, and you separate them, you can begin to see the logic that was used was to show that the third angel arrives at 9 11.
So we've gone through the GC quote. And we've gone through Matthew 13, which was built upon the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages. And I think that's why we've said that the third angel not only arrives before the Sunday law, we can actually define when it comes. And by the way, we get 9-11 from the former reign because we understood that when this event occurred, things changed in God's church. And the spring and the former rain began to be poured out. Does anybody have any questions? Mark. Do the servants also work before um, the uh, the second three marks? Do the servants do the work of plowing as well? It's a question. So the, qu so the question is, who does that work? For sure, it's going to have to be somebody. It's unlikely to be the farmer. So I agree, it's the servants. <coughs> but we're not opening the passage up. <coughs> Sorry. Because <coughs> this is with a revision of an existing study. So I'm not explaining this part of it. Your, your observation is valid. And I don't want to I don't want to throw your statement away by just saying, yeah, that's number one. And we don't have time to demonstrate it. But we would be able to. When we talk about the plowing, whether it's a throwaway statement or good methodology. We said this was plowing the fallow land. Undoing the work of darkness. Because that's what fallow land was. And that's the first angel's message. Now you can say, fear God. Which is this preparation to be righteous. So yes, it's the servants, but it's a different role, I would argue. And we've not discussed who the harvesters are. We've run out of time, unless anybody's got a pressing question. Pressing question? Wenn ich sehe, dass die... No, no, in English. Okay. okay. English. When you see the angels and the... Some... I think or I thought that that's why we shouldn't uh, work with the Levites and the Nethanims. Or is it completely something else? I think it's completely something else. Okay, it is a pressing question because we're already late. Esther? What does it mean that the servants sowing the plants and the, and the enemy is coming in the night? The enemy, the night. So we had... Uh, so we had Esther's the... asking about some detail in the story 
And I know it may be an important question to you. But I don't think it's going to help us to develop this thought any further. We had one more question. I'm trying English. So um, in one of your presentation on Revelation 14, you show... One second, are you okay? You showed us that uh, the message, the third message arrived from uh, the time of the end. When we... Um, yeah. When we read, we read the uh, Revelation fourteen, uh, verse six or seven. I don't know. When we we saw uh, the third angel that said that. Um, I don't know how to manage with that. So. I may have played loose and casual with the work of the third angel. By placing it here at the time of the end. So I'm not denying that presentation that I did. But that would not be the, the pure definition of where to place the angels. I think what I was trying to show was the similarity between the first and the third, which is a, which is a different issue or a different topic than the one that we're addressing now. So I wanted us to see the similarities between the first and the third. It wasn't to move or replace the third to the time of the end. It's the reason why I don't I don't say said uh, the third angel but the third message. So for me if you try to separate the third message from the third angel you get into trouble. So if I had said third message, read third angel. Read it, that it means the same as the third angel. It's the same. But I don't think that study, we might say that's a more of an advanced study. I don't think it, it destroys or fights against this truth. I was trying to bring a different point. I have to finish, I'm sorry. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your continued watch care over us as you guide and direct us in the truth. May we ever remember to keep the old paths in the forefront of our minds. Only by remembering the past can we ensure that we will remain on the true path. We thank you for this camp meeting. We thank you for the time we've had here. We thank you for the work of your servants we thank you most of all for taking care of us.